which you will find today in Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, we pray and ask God to open up this scripture to us now. <coughs> we pray together. Father, even as we hear in apocalyptic terms that which is spoken of uh, more plainly in other scriptures, we pray that you would reveal to us, Lord God, that you love all the races of the world. All people who would place their faith in the Lord Jesus are equally invited into the holy worship and that their sacrifices on the altar are acceptable to you. Open our ears, open our hearts, make us attentive today, Lord, attentive to hear every word you speak to your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like a roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens, and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy, say, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Today I would ask you to consider what would we know about God if he didn't reveal himself in the Holy Scriptures? Well, surely we would not know that he is Trinity. We would not know the dual nature of the perfect manhood and full deity of Jesus Christ. And you know what else we wouldn't know? We wouldn't know that God loves all the races of the world and calls all the peoples of the world to himself particularly because the history of Israel had begun in a certain way. Don't you marry those Canaanites. Be sure when you go into the land to drive them out, because if you don't drive them out, you will wind up intermarrying with them. You will marry the uncircumcised. You will worship their gods, and I will come and destroy you. There was strong language against mixing the pure race of the Hebrews with the others for a time. But a new day is about to dawn, a day that will be both bitter and sweet. Sweet in the mouth, but bitter in the stomach. Now you may recall from chapter 7, we had had an interlude. I'm going to show you again the structure of the book and how John writes his book. We started out with seven seals, but between the sixth and seventh seal, there is this interlude of the sealing of 144,000. Most of the chapters of Revelation are about what God is going to do, particularly chapter 6 through 16, 
what God is going to do in judging apostate Israel. However, in the interludes, God answers the question, what happens to the church? I know what happens to the enemies of the church. That's the judgments of the seals, the trumpets, the wonders, and the bowls, sometimes called the vile, the vials. But also this, there's an interlude today. The mystery of God in the little book, the little scroll that is both sweet and bitter, and what we'll cover next week with the two witnesses. So God is going to have these interludes, and he's going to answer the probing question. Well, what happens to the church? Today's message is going to be delivered by another angel. Now, when the reader reads that there's a first angel, we're talking about the trumpets, the first angel, the second angel, the third angel, the fourth angel, the fifth angel, the sixth angel, but now it's not the seventh angel. We won't get to him until verse 7. Today, we're going to start out with another angel. That lets the reader know, wait a minute, something different is going on here. This isn't the seventh angel. This is another angel. The majority of what we read in chapter 6 through 16, as I said, deals with what is God going to do with the greatest enemy of the church of the day, which was the apostate Jews. Read the book of Acts. Who is harassing the apostle Paul and chasing him throughout the Mediterranean? It was the unbelieving, unconverted Jews. Also, we're going to see what God is going to do with the church. The seven-horned lamb, Jesus Christ, is unloosing the seals, and these angels are blowing the trumpets. However, in the previous, as in the previous interlude with the sealing of 144,000, today we're going to start to answer the question, but what's God going to do with the church? Is something that he had said many times in the Old Testament, but was not from the center in their theology. God had told them, I'm going to call Gentiles to myself. But it was certainly not something popular among the Jews of the day. This mighty angel is given a description which helps us going to identify him. This is important. Remember, this is not simply one of the many numbered angels. This is another angel. He's different. He's clothed with the cloud and a rainbow about his head. His face shines like the sun, and he has feet like pillars of fire. Now, the symbols with which John describes this particular angel helps us identify this angel as none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look back at chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, John describes Jesus as having feet like burnished bronze in the furnace. If you've ever seen metal being smelted, you know what I'm talking about? It has that orange, weird glow that's kind of always moving about. That's how John describes Jesus' feet in chapter 1, which he identifies as Jesus, and how he describes the feet of this another angel here in chapter 10. Also, in verse uh, 16 of chapter 1, his face was like the sun shining in full strength. That sounds very similar to how he describes this angel, the face above the brightness of the sun. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Why does God, why does John describe Jesus as an angel? Well, remember, angel merely means messenger. In fact, we can look at Old Testament scriptures, which also utilize the language of angel and messianic language together. I'm going to show you that. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. Very messianic language, right? And the angel of his presence saved them. Anglos al autus, curios ss on autus. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. And from Malachi... The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Reference to Palm Sunday when Jesus Christ comes into the temple suddenly. And the messenger, and the word there again is angelos, of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So, when you see this another angel, you should understand this is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is delivering the message 
what's going to happen to the church. We have so many chapters on what's going to happen to the apostate Israel who is opposing the church, but today we're going to focus on what God is going to do to his church. Now, I've already hinted at several times this mystery that is being revealed, this mystery, and part of what's going to help us reveal what this mystery is, is he has a rainbow about his head. Now, if I say feet like pillar of fire, face like the brightness of the sun, voice like the roar of a lion, you think power, you think might. But when I say he has a rainbow about his head, what biblical imagery is called to your mind? Remember the story of Noah and the flood. And God said, I will give you a sign in the sky of the bow so that I would never again flood the whole earth. God is saying that this message, whatever this message is, and it'll be more plain as we go along, is going to be a message of mercy to all the people of the world because his head is impressed in a rainbow. It reminds me of the prayer of Habakkuk in which he said, O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O oh Lord, do I fear in the midst of years, revive it. In the midst of years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. These interludes are mercy in the midst of wrath. Seals, one, two, three, four, five, six, wrath, seven, wrath. But in between six and seven, there's that little tiny interlude of the ceiling of the 144,000, and that's about mercy. Also, when you get to the trumpets, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's about wrath. But between six and seven trumpets, it's a little bit of mercy. God remembers mercy amidst his wrath. Friends, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are living proof that God remembers mercy amidst wrath. The success of the church throughout the centuries is proof positive that God remembers mercy amidst wrath. And the bringing together of all the nation, Jews and Gentiles, into one new man in Christ is proof positive that God remembers mercy amidst wrath. Now, we are not those who deceive ourselves and of what the Bible clearly says and what is everywhere evident God is a God of wrath. You cannot read seals, one, two, three, four, five, six, trumpets, one, two, three, four, five, six, vials, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and not see that God is a God of wrath. People deny it, but it's everywhere in the scriptures, and it's everywhere in the world if you'll have eyes to see it. But we're not also those who refuse to see that there's a lot of mercy. Friends, if you believed on Christ, you're living proof that God is a merciful God. Well, this another angel gives John a little book, a little biblion, which you can hear our English word Bible or book, and the identity of message of the book is going to be revealed in both its sweetness and its bitterness. Now again, when you read a passage like this, I think the temptation is to throw up your hands and say, well, that's it. I knew it. I knew that Revelation was un indecipherable. I almost said undecipherable. I think it's indecipherable. But no, it's, it's understandable. In fact, we have a statement almost exactly like it. We say, instead of I've got something bitter and something sweet, you know what we say? I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. It's almost the same thing. This angel cries out and John's about to write what he had heard the seven thunders say, and he's told, don't write it, seal it up. Now this tells me that this probably is about the indefinite future. Not so with the most of Revelation. Most of Revelation, remember the word Revelation is apocalypse, which means a revealing. Most of Revelation is about revealing to the first century seven churches what is getting ready to happen on the world stage in the first century. However, there is this bit that John is told, don't write that down. This is not pertaining, this is me speaking, this is not pertaining to the first century church and the calamities that are going to befall Israel. 
I always tell you this. God in the Bible answers every necessary question. That does not mean that he answers every curious question. Do you have questions that the Bible doesn't really seem to answer? Yeah. And you know what? That's okay. God doesn't have to tell us everything. In fact, in the scriptures, he tells us. I'm not going to tell you everything. Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Now I'm going to give you another hint of this message, this mystery that this angel, the first hint was the rainbow about his head. It's a message of mercy. It's a message to all the world that you're not going to be exposed to the great wrath. This angel stands and takes an oath. He raises his right hand in an oath, and he swears by the eternality and creatorship of God. And he has one foot upon the sea and one foot upon the land. Now, if your translation says that he has one foot upon the earth, that's technically a correct translation, but it's nevertheless insufficient. We should translate it instead that he has one foot upon the land. Also, look at what it says. He says, there should be time no longer. This is a fine translation, but it is misleading, and I want to get to what is a better translation. And the NIV, I think, has it correct. The Amplified Bible reads that there should be no more waiting or delay. The Weist Word Studies, which is a four-volume set, reads, there should be no more delay or respite. I point this out because if you're reading the Old King James Version, you're likely to read it and think, well, this is the end of the world. Because after all, it does say there should be time no longer. It's better translated that there won't be any more delay. So what this angel, who is Jesus, is really saying is Israel's Time is up. What is the delay? The delay brings the reader's mind back to the fifth seal when the saints are under the altar crying out this question. Along, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So when the angel says, no more delay, it's an answer to this question. They're asking, how much longer the angel with a rainbow about his head comes down and says, no longer. In fact, when the seventh trumpet sounds, which will be in chapter 11, verse 15, so we're real close. When the seventh angel sounds, then you're going to get your answer. You who were martyred in the first century, you're going to get your answer, and it's going to be a doozy. So reading it this way, we understand that a new day is about to dawn. Those martyrs under the altar are about to be delivered their vengeance with the one whose face shines like the sun and whose feet are like burnished brass, who is clothed with a rainbow and a cloud and has the voice of a lion. You see, my friend, watch me, watch me. Jesus Christ is not forever going to allow the church to be the wiping mat of world history. Jesus Christ delivers his church and so we pray today, Lord Jesus Christ, even as you answered those martyrs from the first century under the altar, during the first century, we pray, God, deliver those who are wrongfully in prison. God, watch for your suffering church and come and bring vengeance upon those who would work evil against your church. Our second clue as to this mystery comes in the form of where Jesus is standing. Again, he has his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. This is our second clue. John is later going to introduce a beast of the land and a beast of the sea. And I'm going to wind up giving you this same interpretation then as I do today. What are we to understand about the land. Now again, some of your translations might say the earth, and that's a fair, technically correct translation, but it is misleading. You should translate it the land. He has his foot 
on the land of Israel. Abraham, look out across the land. Walk all the steps of the land. Every step you step on, I'm going to give you the land. Jesus has his foot on the Jewish nation. Jesus also has his foot on the sea. Now, what are we to make of this? Because if you get the um, key to interpretation, it will become as plain as the nose on your face. How does the Bible utilize the language of sea? We'll see it here. Reach down your hand from on high, deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hand of foreigners. So the sea, or the oceans, or the turbulence thereof, is often depicted as foreign nations or Gentiles. Woe to the many nations that rage. They rage like the raging sea. There it is. Woe to the peoples who roar. They roar like the roaring of great waters. So what is Jesus standing on? Jesus is standing on the land, Jew. Jesus is standing on the sea, Gentiles. And he's raising his hand to the God of heaven, creator and eternal God, and saying, time is up. Time is up for the mystery to be revealed. So here's what we know. We're also going to get a clue about the proximity of time, and this is very important. That Jesus Christ is saying, the time in which I'm going to merge the Jew and Gentile, that mystery that had long before been spoken of in the prophets of old, is about to take place with the final vengeance to the Jewish nation. The mystery that God has finished as he declared to his servants and prophets. Now, here's another help in understanding what this mystery is. Because he clearly says that whatever this mystery is, it was already revealed in the Old Testament in the prophets. In your responsive reading this morning, we read several passages in which God is calling the foreign nations to himself from Isaiah. And there will come from the rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now remember, Jesse is David's father. So when you hear this language, stem of Jesse, what you're really hearing is Davidic line, kingly line, tribe of Judah. And a branch will grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And in that day there will be a root of Jesse which will stand for a sign to the people. To him shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest will be glorious. So by now, you should have figured out the message of this another angel. He's got a rainbow about his head, which speaks of God's universal care of mercy for all peoples. He's standing on the land, Jew, and sea, Gentile, and he's taking an oath. And here's what he's basically saying. Today's a new day. Today is a day where I'm taking Jew and Gentile, and I'm going to marry them into one new man in Christ. This is what I perceive to be the sweetness of the book that John is about to eat. John is about to eat a book that is both sweet and bitter. The sweetness of the book is the fact that God is making out of two, one, new man in Christ. The Apostle Paul also utilizes this language of mystery referring to the marriage of Jew and Gentile from Ephesians, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. There it is, the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed. Again, it was there but now it is much more clear in the New Testament. Revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. Also by the apostle Paul. For he, Jesus, is our peace, who has made both, that would be Jew, Gentile, one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law and commandments contained in the ordinances to make of himself of the twain, one new man so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now here's the reality. You and I are Gentiles, and we 
grown up in all of our lives in Gentile churches. And so this does not have the punch that the first century readers would have experienced. If you're part of that 144,000, which are the Jewish converts who have been sealed with Satan to live to the next generation, and you're told, by the way, you know who else is coming to the party? Gentiles. That would have been a punch to them. But you know, it's not different than what Jesus said during his ministry. Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's Jewish language if you're not clear on that. In the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Joel, the prophet, tells us that God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Today we live in a world that says, your race is right. Your race is wrong. This race can't get along with that race. And do you know why? Because we've thrown out the God of the Bible. The way forward in race relations is not groveling. It's not placating. It's reteaching the world that there's only one God, and he has made all the races of the world, and he loves all all the races of the world, and he's inviting all the races of the world to himself. Only the gospel can heal the racial mess that we're in. And trying to heal it without it, you're just kidding yourself and create more and more angst in the society. God made all the races. God is inviting all the races eating of the little book, again, you're going to want to pull up your hands and say, well, I need it. You can't understand the book of Revelation because he's eating a book. What am I to make of this? Well, again, it's sweet, it's bitter. We say almost the same thing. I got good news, I got bad news. What's the good news? Well, the good news, the sweetness, is what I've already said, that he is making out of two, one, new man. What's the bad news? The bad news is I'm going to have to destroy apostate Israel in order to bring that about. That's the bitter news. In fact, bitter and curses go together in Scripture. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he will blot them out with bitter water. Okay? How do we interpret Scripture? By looking at other Scriptures. Because they are going to act as the key to unlock how we are to understand things. So when John has sweetness in his mouth, sweet is good, sweet is easy, that's easy to figure out. Bitter, we might have a question about. Bitter in the belly means curses. Look, if you had grown up all your life going to temple, loving the holy city of Jerusalem, to know that God was going to say that not one stone of the temple will be laid upon another, it will all be leveled, that's going to be bitter. Friends, Paul himself said, if it were possible, I would be accursed from Christ if it meant the salvation of my brothers according to the flesh. Paul loved the Jewish people. He desperately wanted the Jewish people to come to Christ, even if it would be through his own damnation. Okay? You're always allowed to be brokenhearted over those in your family who are lost. You should be brokenhearted over those in your family who are lost. It is bitterness in the belly. The strangeness of this text is that the bitterness and the sweetness go together. John literally swallows, he internalizes this message, and Jesus says this message is going to go to kings and nations and powers throughout the world, and it has. The Jew-Gentile church is all that there is now. There is no Jewish church and Gentile church. There is one church in Jesus Christ. And friend, if you believe in Christ, you're part of that church. Jesus Christ stands upon the sea and the land with his hand raised to the eternal and powerful God. He takes an oath. Time is no more. Delay is no more. Judgment is coming to the apostates. This is the meaning of the text.
Father, we are thankful for a church that invites all the races of the world on equal footing. We are thankful for our church and a Savior who says to every color, race, tongue, and people and nation, you can find forgiveness in Christ. Lord God, heal our nation. Our nation is so broken because we've forgotten the God who made all the races and calls all the races to the gospel. Lord God, heal us of this desperate wound. We pray in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen. Stand and receive God's blessing. I invite you back tonight at 5 as we continue our work through Malachi. Very good series. Hear now the blessing of your Lord. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God, even our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work.